Welcome to AviaDev Insight Africa, the podcast dedicated to the world of African aviation with your host, John Howell, CEO and founder of AviaDev Africa. Ahead of the AviaDev Africa online event, which takes place on the 9th to the 11th of June, we're delighted to bring you a good news story from an airline that may have been flying under the radar somewhat for some of us in the industry. Today, we find ourselves in bustling Nairobi, Kenya, where we're going to focus on an airline that's innovated its operation and its business model, and recently launched new services to, to Kisumu and Mombasa. The airline in question is 748 Air Services, and they were also the launch customer for the de Havilland Simplified Package Freighter solution on their de Havilland Dash 8 100s, allowing them to flexibility to carry cargo. To discuss this and so much more, I'm delighted to say I am joined by the airline's CEO, Moses Mwangi. Moses, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, John. Well, and thanks. I'm happy for, that you have me. Thanks for taking the time. We appreciate it because it's been such an incredibly busy month and we're going to come to that shortly. But let's start by getting a bit of an introduction. Let our listeners know a little bit more about who you are, what your background is, and uh, what 748 does. Yes, uh, my background, I, I started as an accountant uh, many years back and initially uh, specialized in, a, in manufacturing accounting up until 24 years ago. And in the last 24 years ago, I've done nothing else except aviation. I've done general aviation, I've done airlines, more so what I would refer to as humanitarian aviation. Having said that, I have also got involved in uh, airlines, startup airlines like Rwanda Air. During the startup, I was involved, you know, uh, as a consultant and also the CFO. Uh, in the last eight years, I've been working for 748, managing the data operations as a managing director. Thank you. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about the business model of, um, so it's 748, is that how I say it? Not 748, 748. 748. 748. So tell yeah. us uh, about the business model before COVID actually hit and how that pandemic then has obviously impacted the operation and your, and your strategy. Yes. Now, 748 business model has always been very different from uh, most of the airlines, especially in this region. Whilst most of the airlines work with these aircraft, we, from the origin of the company, we decided that we would own the aircraft. And we have always invested our resources to ensure that uh, we have the airline. We have kept away from any finance leases, loans, and everything. We don't, we don't have an aircraft unless we own it. We currently operate 14 aircraft, and only one is on a dry lease. Now, 748 model from the very, very beginning started as humanitarian in the humanitarian sector. And up to the day today, we are still very much, our core business is still humanitarian. We work with all the various international organizations, uh, UN Peacekeeping New York, World Food Program, ICLC, IOM, European Union, ECHO, Humanitarian Office. Those are mainly, have mainly been our, our client. And, for the, for the many years, we fairly specialized. Currently, as we stand, we are all over Africa. We have aircraft shed, doing scheduled flights for humanitarian in Mali. We are also in Niger. Mostly these countries where we, well, we have humanitarian issues. We are in Chad. We are also in South Sudan. We are in Congo DRC with an aircraft base, with a Q400 base uh, in Kinshasa. We are also in Somalia, Mogadishu. And we also have flights that fly out of uh, Wilson Airport to the ref refugee centers in Kenya, mainly Dadaab and Kakuma. 
So that has mainly been our, our, our model. But some years back, four years ago, we decided that we are going to diversify and change the model. Uh, make, and enter into domestic domestic aviation and to be followed by regional aviation, uh, regional flights. This has taken a bit of time because we've been working on the numbers and uh, and trying to see how everything 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 ties up. So so generally that that has been that has been a, that has been our model. Now this model, how how do we get how are we uh, <clears throat> impacted? using our model. One of the advantages that we had, again, compared to most of the airlines, because we don't, we own the aircraft, the pressure on finance was not as much as the other airlines. The other very big advantage that we can say that we had is that being one of the major players in the humanitarian aviation and working for organizations like UN, EU, we were, to some extent covered because UN still continued with the flights, even when the whole world closed. Yes, the hours were less, everything was less, but it actually gave us a leeway where everybody else stopped. Our business was still, we still had business with the, the humanitarian organization, which accounted for more than 50% of what used to have. So, when we look at it, we can say that in a way we, 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 were, we were fairly lucky that we didn't see ourselves really affected in the same way that other, other companies were affected when the COVID hit. Mm. One of the most interesting bit is that even with COVID, we, were not, we did not reduce our staff even by a single soul. In 2019, we actually increased our staff by quite a number because we are still pursuing our strategy. COVID did not interfere with our strategy. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, you talk yeah. about diversification. There's a lot of lessons that can be learned because a lot of airlines got very much caught out by the fact they hadn't diversified. And they're not yeah. the only ones. Airports as well that were just super reliant on aeronautical revenues, exactly the same thing. So you already had that diversification. Would you, would you say that it was fair that COVID accelerated the diversification process? You did things a bit quicker than maybe you would have done? It gave opportunities in that respect? Or did it all kind of, it was going to happen anyway? Let me tell you, you find this one very, very interesting. I would actually say that uh, it was going to happen. One of the major, I mean, 2019 is a very, I mean, in our calendar, it's a very, very important uh, year. Because we didn't even know about COVID but we had actually made arrangements to move from the smaller airport to the major airport. And I'm talking of moving from Wilson Airport as our main base to JKA, Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. Partly the reason why we are moving to Jomo Kenyatta, which, which has actually been uh, in our plan for a number of years, was actually to make sure that we are in Jomo Kenyatta, and from Jomo Kenyatta, with the, with, the, with the bigger aircraft that we have, we could actually be able to start the domestic flights and also the regional ones. With Jomo Kenyatta, we, we also had access to a bigger hangar, hangar that, that we, now, we now own at Jomo Kenyatta, uh, more parking space for aircraft, and also a nice office headquarters for 748 where we brought up all our staff together. And like before at Wilson Airport where we, our offices were all over in, in about four or five places, we are now able to bring everybody under one floor and in one building that, that we own and uh, are working from. So that was one of, that was one of our, 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 our major ones. We can also say that even during that same, same year, we were able to take advantage of, of, of the market and were able to acquire a Dash 8400, even with all that was happening. And this was in the plan and COVID did not stop us from doing it. And uh, partly it's because of, uh, we, when COVID hit, and that was 
and we came to know it to know about it end of February, we started working on it. And we, we came up with a number of inno innovation where we involved people like uh, the Havilland, the manufacturer of the aircraft. We actually approached them and to come up and worked with them together to come up with a, a solution for making this the, 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 the aircraft more flexible. Work out on the simplified cargo solution which would allow us to, to convert the aircraft from, uh, from, from uh, passenger to cargo. Because we realized very, very early that uh, with COVID, there will be movement of cargo, there will be need for freighters, but it will be difficult to do the passengers. And that was one of the items that really assisted us in our, in our progress. Yeah, so let's and, and mitigating, yeah, mitigating. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's talk about that in a bit more in a bit more detail. So yeah. really you you sat down with the de Havilland team and you said, look, this is what we'd like to do with the aircraft that we've got. So this is both yes. the Dash 8 100s and the 400s as well. Yes. Um how 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 does the process work? You know, tell us about the actual process when you when you make that change from the passenger to the cargo. How quickly can you change the configuration of the aircraft, for example? It's, it's, it's very interesting. Let me first say that, uh, let me first add the fact that we were the, the lounge customer for the, for, the, for the Dash 8 worldwide because of the fact that uh, we worked with, with the Havilland. And the fact that all our fleet of the Dash 8 400 and the Dash 8 100 have all, all, all of them have the kit which means we can actually do the conversion. The interesting bit is that to convert from full passenger to full cargo, the process takes only an hour. Wow. So you, you, you move from a, a, a Q400 that is flying 76 passengers to a cargo freighter that takes nine tons to every destination. Because of this one, especially at the initial stage, the, hum the humanitarian side of it, World Food Program, you know, when every no airline was moving, especially this part of Africa, we were able to work with the humanitarian industry and we were the first people to move uh, the PPEs all over this region. We, we were able to do that. So it gave us an edge which nobody else had. Just to add to that, because of that again, we also worked with the World Food Program in Rome and assisted them in form formulating a World Food Program group of rights. As a result of it, we were their contractor for this part of Africa. So we, so we had aircraft when no, our national airline here, K uh, KQ or the, and other airlines were not flying, we, we we were able to fly from Nairobi, take the UN, uh, the, the UN passengers from Nairobi to Addis, where they could connect to, to the rest of the world. And we could also do it from Somalia. We had aircraft based in Somalia that could also uh, would take the, uh, the UN staff from Somalia, also to, to Addis, and also from South Sudan, uh, Juba. And this was very, very used closely and every day by UN and the European Union uh, Humanitarian Office. And also, of course, the UN Peacekeeping New York. And it meant a lot of rights. So at one stage, you could actually land in, in Addis and find about five or six aircraft coming from our company. Wow, that's That fantastic. was very much, you know, that in a way mitigated anything. And uh, we felt that uh, by being innovative, working with the, with, the, with the manufacturer and working closely with our clients that we were able to kind of block anything that COVID uh, was going to bring to us. Mm. And that is why we, we, we were able, even in 2019 when everybody else was doing nothing, we were able even to move offices and even buy an aircraft. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Awesome. There aren't there aren't too many airlines that you know that that have actually started or that have expanded or you know in in that respect over that period of time. And 
so yeah you saw the timing as a blessing blessing not a curse so i think exactly. i think i think that's you know that's such a such a great story to talk about how you've got this now this conversion and how you've worked with the with the manufacturer to bring that bring that together um i want to talk to you now a little bit more before, about before you move away from yeah, that please. i just wanted to add how it actually evolved okay we, yeah please uh, one of the biggest advantages we have is that we also have an office in toronto we have an, a fully fledged office in Toronto. And partly the main reason why we have this office is because of uh, anything to do with the spares and consumables and everything. Like you might imagine, the, the Haviland aircraft, most of the spares, components, and everything, the source is always North America. So we, and we, we realized that a long time ago. So we established an office in, in, uh, in Toronto. So we have actually a team that works there. And our chairman also spends a lot of time there. So it was very easy for them to, even with all the, the closures and everything, to walk to the, the Haviland and start this talk. Now, this started very, very early. We were able to meet, even before COVID had exploded, we were able to meet them as early as beginning of March. And that is why this made a lot of difference. So by the time in April, uh, countries like our country was closing down, we already had a, something in place. I just, well, I just thought I should mention that one to you because it plays in the equation. It absolutely does. I think, you know, what a fantastic, fantastic idea. And it shows that partnership and that relationship that you have with the, with the manufacturer and the fact that they listened to you and said, how can yeah. we provide the solution that you're looking for? You know, let's come up with this solution. Um, and I know that that James from De Havilland, who's going to be speaking at Avia Dev Africa, you know, him and the team, they've they've sat down and said, right, how can we support you? And that's what our panel's all about. It's about how OEMs can and have supported their their customers through the pandemic. So I think it's a great example of that. Let's yeah. talk about the passenger side of things, because it's been an incredibly busy month. You've launched new routes to Mombasa and Kisumu, as we said in the in the initial start. Um, yes. What's behind this? Was this always a long-term strategy? Did you see an opportunity in the market that's appeared due to COVID? Or are you seeing some sort of recovery in the domestic market that you, you know, that there is pent up demand to travel? Yes. When the goings get tough, the, the tough get going. And we realize it very fast that uh, when COVID hit, the capacity reduced, especially in the domestic. And whilst we had, uh, we always had uh, the plan to start our scheduled, plan, the, our, our, our scheduled uh, freights, the effect of all this, even to our humanitarian industry, meant that there is a capacity still that we had that was excess. In the, in the to, to, to the requirement of the humanitarian office because even the, even the humanitarian staff were not making movements like they normally do. So we realize the best thing to do is to start without wasting time. And we decided to really differentiate our product. And the main main <clears throat> main driver we, we've come out so well. We are very famous in this, in this market, especially the humanitarian one, on matters that are safe, safety, that involve safety, and also the quality of the product. And we thought, what a better time than this one to introduce ourselves to the domestic market. Because whilst, yes, <clears throat> aviation has been affected, but when you look at it, it's not very much domestic. What has been affected mainly is international. And we saw a window and realized that, you know, we can start, we can make sure that the Kenyans can test our product. And, the, and we didn't see a better time than this one. And we also realized that if we don't do it now, this market could uh, end up being kind of monopolistic. But we, if we get in there, uh, sharp, with a with a real sharpened pencil, we can create 
a bigger mass market. Because that is what we are trying to do. Here in Africa, it's very, very different compared to Europe or, or North America, where everybody can fly. But this, this market is very much an elitist market. Very few people fly. And there is no good reason for not flying. So what we have done is to work out lean and mean, but try to go to the masses with a fairer price that people can get to and start flying. We be, the, good, the good thing also about uh, our country, Kenya, compared to other African countries, we, we, we have a middle class. We have one of the leading middle mm. class in Africa. Mm. So there is quite a number of people who can actually travel into all these internal destinations. So we decided that we are going to market the product to them. We decided, and uh, so this month of May, we went for Kisumu destination as the first one. We launched it on 20th. Today is 28th, and I can tell you the numbers are working. Great. It's all according to our plan. Uh, not, of course, in the initial stage, it's, it's difficult, and we all, we all know that, but we have worked it out. We know we have to, to cut the bill for some time, but we are open to it. Now, this, this, this is being followed by flights to Mombasa, which is our second city, and also flights to uh, Ukunda. It's a tourist destination, which is very, very, very busy. And uh, of course, tourism is still affected, but we can see, see, see a return of tourism, mm. both uh, domestic and, uh, and local. So, we, I mean, I mean international. So we are hoping that those numbers can be able to, and uh, by December, we can't see any reason why those numbers should not be high. Yeah, and, and what about what about the aircraft? So you've used the, the Dash 8 400 on these routes. So why, what, what makes that the right aircraft for the routes? Yes, there is a reason for using the, the De Havilland. I can tell you, there isn't a better turbo prop aircraft for those kind of routes. Or any destination from uh, Nairobi takes a maximum of one hour. This is a, this is the same same uh, time that a flight will take to fly to even if you are using a jet. So if you use a jet, you use a prop. That's a, that, that's the time one hour. If you use anything that if you use a turbo prop, which is not uh, the De Havilland that, Dash Eight uh, Four Hundred, then of course the, the the time the time increases. The, the time increases significantly. Mm. Yeah, it's finding that sweet spot to make sure. Yeah, so, a, so this aircraft right is right uh, it's versatile, it's fast, and uh, it's fairly, fairly, fairly comfortable compared Absolutely. to other type of aircraft. Absolutely. Now, again, it's the issue, it's the capacity. We are talking of the aircraft that we are going to use uh, have configuration of between 74 and 78 seating capacity. So when we look at it again with the numbers and everything, we think that is the aircraft to launch with. We I can't that... see ourselves using uh, a, a, an aircraft with a, with, with a lesser capacity. Yeah, it's perfect because, like you said, you want to create those volumes. Um, you know, so that you you make sure that the seats are sold, but you're not putting over capacity into the market. So it's yes. it's that initial start of okay, we're a week in, and we have projections; they're realistic. But we're yeah. going to going to create that competition. Ultimately, this is great for the Kenyan traveling public because you're going to create a competitive environment where there isn't a monopolistic uh, um, situation. So I'm sure that the the Kenyan people are really really happy about this and uh, it gives them options and, and that creates competition. It drives down, drives down the price and increases the need for efficiency, which sounds like something that's really at the heart of 748's uh, operation. So let's have a little look into the future then. So you've done so much the last couple of years, you've achieved so much, you've brought new aircraft into the fleet. 
what's the strategy of 748 in terms of destinations, in terms of um, cargo, charter, your humanitarian work, I'm sure will carry on and the fleet as well. Um, what, 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 what are the plans? What should we look forward to? Yes. Going forward, like you just stated, of course, humanitarian aviation will, will continue. We will also continue to increase our domestic coverage. So there are other destinations like Dolet, Malindi, and Lamu that we, that we are planning to launch in a month's time. So, 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 so that's, that, so that's a, the immediate one. After we settle the domestic one and we get to the break-even points, we will move to our second stage. And the second stage is to create a regional, uh, regional destinations. We're going to cover the regional destinations without going very far, but at least the neighboring countries. And at that point, we are also going to have bigger equipment. We believe that uh, if you are going to fly for more than one hour, it's, 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 it's at that point that you need the jets. And uh, we have identified the Boeing 737s. That is the idea that you, that is the aircraft that, of choice that we are going to go for. So we are hoping that by early next year, we'll be able to launch the regional destinations. Super exciting. And we'll, uh, we'll be here to support that messaging as well. So, you know, don't, don't, don't hesitate to let us know when that, when that, uh, when that happens. So be, finally, before, before we go, I just wanted to ask you a final question, which is just, you've, you've been around the block. You know, I think it's fair to say you've worked in different airlines. You've, you've, you've seen African aviation develop over the years. Are you positive about the future of African aviation? Do you see change coming? Because things like that dominate my conversations most days, like SATAM, Open Skies, they've been talked about your entire career um, and, and definitely mine, and they still feel a fair way away, although we've got some processes in place at an African continental level through the AU. So, you know, how do you see, I want to understand from your side, how do you see the future generally for African aviation? Yes, African, African aviation, the population do not have a, a choice because this is what this is a, a continent without any infrastructure. Uh, there are no roads, there are no railways, railway uh, connections to be relied on. Almost the whole continent, and uh, the, the continent is very diversified. I mean, you are talking of equatorial forests, the Congo. You are also talking about deserts. It's a mixture of everything, kaleidoscope of anything that you can ever imagine. When you have such a scenario, it's easier and faster to, to have aviation connections. It's much cheaper to create airport airstrips and to bring the aircraft and transport from A to B. And that's why we see that in Africa, even you know very well before COVID, the growth every year has been 6%. I believe that it should be higher, especially if uh, the African countries can uh, offer their faith freedom much more than they are doing. And we see it like in our region with the South African community, there's a lot of freedom and we can't see anything else. We have to open these boundaries. If you don't open these air, air boundaries, it's, it's going to drain, but that's all that it can do. Aviation in Africa will be the only thing, will be the way to go. Yeah, I, I see the 6% accelerating to even, to even maybe 10% as the economies grow. And there is, before COVID, there was, we could see in Africa some growth that was not seen for very many years especially in the last five years. And we can't see anything else. COVID is not going to be with us forever. Uh, in a period of two years, we should actually be able to see much more growth uh, going forward. Amazing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, we completely 
believe in the opportunity here and everything that everybody says when they do a feasibility study of is Africa a good place for aviation? Of course, the population, the geography, everything tells you that it has to be the only way to connect the continent. And we're not connecting it well enough, which is great to hear that an airline like 748 is looking at that regional connectivity. And as I say, giving choice, which creates competition, which makes it better and more accessible for more and more African people to actually take a flight and removes that need, like you said, for it to be an elitist uh, mode of transport, which of course it's not seen that way in the US or in Asia or in Europe. It's seen very much as a a, 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 a sort of a, a right to have access to that, especially pre-COVID time. So thank you so much, Moses, for sharing your story and, and best of luck with 748. We'll be following the story. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, John, for having me. Wonderful. Thank so thank you everybody out there for listening today. Um, don't forget, if you haven't got your ticket yet for Aviadev Africa, you can sign up at aviationdevelop.com forward slash Africa. It's completely free to attend our conference, 9th to the 10th of June. Um, we've got loads more podcasts coming uh, over the next weeks, months and years, I have no doubt. And we're going to continue to help spread the word that African aviation um, has a very bright future and we'll be bringing those voices that are driving that change to the table. So thank you all for joining us and we'll see you for the next episode very soon. Thank you.